Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all. Welcome to the Singapore Management University and to the SMU Presidential Distinguished Lecture. My name is Kimberly Sim and it is an honour to be your MC for this evening. Thank you for joining us here today and of course a very warm welcome to our speaker. Professor Subara Kambampati, or Professor Rao for short, is a Professor of Computer Science at the Arizona State University. He studies fundamental problems in planning and decision making, motivated in particular by the challenges of human aware artificial intelligence systems. Thank you, Professor Rao, for taking time out from your busy schedule to be here with us today. I would now like to invite Professor Lily Kong, President of Singapore Management University, up on stage to introduce our speaker. Professor Kong, please. Professor Subarao Kambampati, distinguished guests, colleagues and students of SMU, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to SMU this afternoon for the second lecture in the Presidential Distinguished Lecturer Series in 2019. Our speaker today is Professor Subarao Kambampati, as you've heard, a professor of computer science at Arizona State University. He was the president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence from 2016 to 2018, and a trustee of the International Joint Conferences on Artificial Intelligence from 2013 to 2018. Prof Rao, if I may, Prof Rao was a recipient of the National Science Foundation Research Initiation Award, the National Science Foundation Young Investigator Award, the IBM Faculty Award, and multiple Google Research Awards. He's currently a fellow of the, Associ the, uh, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, as well as the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Today, Prof Rao will be sharing with us some of his expertise in artificial intelligence with us. As we all know, in this era of digital transformation, AI has become one of the hottest buzzwords. It is increasingly prevalent in many aspects of our daily lives. Given the growing usage of AI, we have incorporated its study into our educational programs. When the SMU School of Information Systems rolled out a revised curriculum for its Bachelor of Science in Information Systems degree in 2017 of August, uh, August of 2017, I beg your pardon, AI was one of its six specialization tracks. When the new academic year begins this year in August, the school will welcome its first class of computer science degree students, and this too will have an AI specialization track. At the postgraduate level, the school has launched a new AI track under its Master of IT in Business program, MITB for short. The AI track is the first of its kind in Southeast Asia. It aims to equip a new generation of IT business leaders in careers that bridge AI with business. In addition, we have an SMU Academy, and for those of you who are not so familiar with it, it is our continuing education and professional training arm. An SMU Academy conducts an AI course for business and IT managers to equip them with the knowledge of what AI is as well as its impact on market and industry. At a more specialized level, the Academy includes AI-related modules in its certification programs, such as the gra Graduate Certificate in Legal Tech. For the banking professionals, the Academy has a course on enhancing detection of fraud and money laundering using AI and machine learning. Aside from research in the area of, I beg your pardon, aside from education in the area of research, our School of Information Systems has been conducting AI research along two main fronts. One thread of research focuses on bringing smart nation analytics to life so as to improve social and economic well-being. A recent system developed by our Living Analytics Research Centre, 
or LARC for short, is Food AI, which seamlessly and interactively captures food intake by matching photos of the food consumed against a database of local food images accompanied by an intervention program to tackle obesity and diabetes through diet monitoring. I'm looking forward to the product that this will come up with for purely personal reasons. A second thread of research focuses on AI methods to improve efficiency in managing urban challenges, including mobility, safety, and security. Through collaborations with government and private organizations, faculty from our School of Information Systems have developed or are developing deployable AI systems. These include a system which has been deployed by the Singapore Civil Defense Force to reduce response time in attending to emergency events. It also includes a collaboration between SMU, Fujitsu, and the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, or ASTAR for short, to develop a system to improve the management of vessel traffic in Singapore's territorial waters. And thirdly, there is a collaboration with the logistics provider Fujitsu, SMU and ASTAR again, for, to develop a system that provides AI-driven delivery recommendations to crowdsourced delivery personnel. So you can see that there are lots of applications for which our research is making an impact on. I would also like to add that SMU launched a new center for AI and data governance housed within our School of Law just a few months ago. And this is to support the work of the Advisory Council on the Ethical Use of AI and Data, which was set up by Singapore's Ministry of Communication and Information. By leveraging the multidisciplinary expertise in our various schools across SMU, the centre has embarked on a number of research projects that deal with AI and society, AI and industry, and AI and commercialisation. Just as one example, one of the projects examines the ethical and social dimensions of developing trust in AI, while another project studies how AI and data-driven technologies will fundamentally change Singapore's labour force. Professor Rao's research interests include human-aware AI systems, automated planning, as well as social media analysis and information integration. And I know he's already been having conversations with our faculty and will continue to do more of that in the day ahead. Today, he will be speaking on the rise of AI and the challenges of human-aware AI systems. For AI systems to assist humans to improve their lives and increase their capability in performing various tasks, there is a need for AI systems to synergistically coordinate and collaborate with humans. How does that actually happen? To facilitate the synergy, human-aware AI systems need to learn and plan, taking into consideration the constraints introduced by humans. On the other hand, for humans to understand and trust the AI systems, human-aware AI systems need to provide explanations for their decisions. These and many other aspects of human-aware AI, such as the transfer of control between humans and AI systems, make Professor Rao's lecture topic an especially important and fascinating one. And I thank all of you for coming, and I'm certain that you will enjoy the lecture in as much as you will learn from it. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Rao. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you, um, President Kung, uh, uh, for your uh, introduction. Um, so I am going to talk about rise of AI and challenges of human-aware um, AI systems, and let's try to get into this. Um, so JBS Haldan is a biologist, 
And um, at one point of time, he mentioned the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. So I think about this of late when I think of AI, because apparently AI in public imagination at least is bigger than you suppose and probably bigger than you can suppose because after all it's been compared to electricity, it's a new electricity, it's been compared to fire and electricity, it's been compared to God, everybody is falling over each other to put AI in their products. Um, this is a smart electronic toothbrush that uses AI technology to improve your teeth cleaning. I am very worried about using it, but if you want to, you might want to buy one. Um, so there is this huge positive hype as well as commercial interest in AI technology. There is on the other side this whole uh, gloom and doom scenarios about AI. AI is bigger threat than North Korea. AI could be the worst event in the history of civilization. That's what Stephen Hawking said. Um, in fact, uh, this morning I was uh, at uh, Channel News Asia for an interview and this is what they started with actually. Um, and then AI is highly likely to destroy humans anyway. Those of you who are keeping track of Elon Musk, when he gets time, uh, when uh, Tesla cars are getting delayed, uh, he spends a lot of time thinking about where AI is going. Okay. So, AI is all over the place. Um, obviously, academia is supposed to be the more you know, careful, uh, coherent thinkers, you know, not falling into major hypes. So, not surprisingly, MIT wants to start a college on artificial intelligence uh, backed by a billion dollars. Um, Carnegie Mellon starts an undergraduate program in AI. China unveils high school AI textbooks. India is starting AI in middle schools and high schools. Now, I know where you see, you see this and you realize this is all too little too late, right? I mean, it's just too late to start AI when you're in high school. So at ASU, me and my colleagues have started talking about in utero AI programs. So <laughs> before your kid comes out is when you need to give the kid the competitive advantage that today's markets need about AI technologies. Okay, now clearly, uh, you know, of course, if you have people to enroll in this program, feel free to do that. Um, but, you know, I shouldn't be complaining too much because where else uh, do people like us, uh, geeks from uh, AI, I've been working in uh, since 1983, get onto TVs, get into White House, get called to your beautiful city. Uh, President Kung was showing me the other people who spoke in this forum and it's really humbling, believe me. Um, and, and so it's kind of fun for people working in AI. Uh, so since a lot of this hype regarding AI sort of coincided, only correlation, um, with my time as the president of uh, AAAI, which is the main scientific association for AI, I sort of consider correlation to be causation. And <laughs> And I believe that I did my part in making AI great again. Okay, so enough of jokes. This is just to wake myself up. Um, the agenda today, I want to do it in like four parts because there are a wide audience, audience with widely ranging um, backgrounds. Uh, the first thing I want to do is what just happened? Why is it that suddenly everybody is talking about AI given that this area existed since 1956? Actually, not every intellectual discipline has a date of birth. There is no date of birth for physics, for example. But there is a date of birth for AI. It was in 1956. There was a conference that was held in Dartmouth, which actually gave this field the name AI. And so, but most of that, its life, nobody cared about it. So why are we talking a lot about it? And then are we done in terms of, uh, you know, the big challenges to be completed? And how do we get AI systems to collaborate with us, which is my main research area? And then finally, depending on time, some thoughts on managing risks and rewards of AI, which is where some of you might be interested in. Are robots going to kill us all? Is the AI systems uh, going to do biased decisions? Are there going to be any jobs left by the time I graduate? Those kinds of questions. So we can talk a little of that. Um, and then, of course, we can talk more during the 
uh, during the questions. Okay, so let me start with the first part, uh, which is what's what just happened in AI. Why are people talking about it? Again, all of you. In fact, I, I have this joke now that the number of AI experts with no actual background in introduction to AI is exponentially increasing. Uh, and so maybe a lot of you already know the answers to this, but I'll try to give you my perspective on that. That might be somewhat useful. So what is AI? Uh, informally, it is sort of developing intelligent agents. An agent which sort of given an environment will do actions that will improve its overall utility. Um, so this is technically designing um, intelligent agents and the circular definition of course is getting machines to do things that when done by humans would be considered intelligent behavior. This is the best definition we actually have for the field. Um, but rather than go into the arcana of that definition, I want to see this from a different perspective. If you look at the way human babies start showing what we consider as signs of intelligence. I know some of your parents think you haven't yet shown any, but if you look at this, you realize that babies come into this world and start showing first perceptual and manipulation intelligence. They're able to see their mother's faces and recognize them. The kids who don't recognize their mother by the face don't exist because they won't get much food. Um, and then they actually start trying to put everything in their mouths. There's this very beautiful manipulation that kids have that we still don't have robots capable of doing that kind of fine motor skills. Um, and then they start showing emotional intelligence, uh, when to cry, when not to cry, when to smile without knowing what smiling does. Um, and then they start showing social and communicative intelligence. They acquire language, they get a theory of mind, they have a sense of that other person has beliefs, desires and intentions too. They don't suck in that particular language, but they have the ability to think about the other and that's how they get to school and not get beaten up. And only finally, they start getting to a point where they can show cognitive and reasoning intelligence. Uh, that seems to be what we get tested in SATs and, um, you know, and, and, and various things. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that this is sort of approximate order in which the signs of intelligence show up. Now, the last time around, AI was so big in the public mind and people would be called on to basically, you know, pontificate on how the world should uh, be using AI technology was in 1980s, uh, the big boom of expert systems. These are basically rule-based systems that would be using the business standards um, operating procedures and then use that to kind of automate some processes, provide decision support and so on. In 90s, we had reasoning systems, uh, things like uh, Deep Blue that dethroned Kasparov. Um, and then it's only much later in 2000s and in really for some of us will start thinking about 2012 as like the watershed movement when we started making pretty big strides in perception, the ability to see the world, the ability not yet to manipulate, but at least to see the world. So image recognition, speech recognition, and some steps at least towards language. For example, we can actually translate language without knowing the meaning. That's something that is possible right now. Now, this is sort of kind of, you probably can think, you know, realize that this makes sense. The thing that I want you to get out of this really is that the direction is completely the opposite. While human babies essentially went from perceptual towards cognitive, AI systems went from cognitive first and then only recently started doing perceptual intelligence. This is a very useful distinction to keep in mind because it explains a lot about what happened in AI and what people are thinking about AI. And so the next slide that I'm going to show which says explains a lot, so kind of trying to push you into thinking that it explains something, but it actually has two big points that I want to try to make, which is why did AI develop in this reverse way? First of all, why did it go from cognitive intelligence to perceptual intelligence? Why couldn't you do perceptual intelligence first, like the way the babies do? And the second, of course, is why did that lead to the increased interest uh, from public in, in AI? Both are connected. So in the context of the reverse way, it's easier to program computers on aspects of intelligence for which we have conscious theories. 
there are aspects of intelligence that we have for which we do have some sort of a conscious theory. We know for example, what is involved in playing chess. We know for example, what is involved in running certain companies, you know, some standard operating procedures and so on. And those are things that we could actually program the computers. But there are, so that's why there is a progress in reasoning and cognitive intelligence first because we were actually programming it using our, our explicit theories. But there are other things that we do such as vision and speech recognition for which we basically have no consciously accessible theories. If anybody tells you they have a theory of how they recognize a cat, you can basically prove them wrong. Okay, because essentially there is no clean theories of what makes something a cat, what makes something a dog and so on. And these are what's called the tacit knowledge and we basically had to learn them essentially ourselves, you know, our human babies essentially uh, hang around, uh, absorb a lot of stimuli from the environment and slowly learn some kinds of models about you know, how, what things are cats and what things are dogs and so on. Um, and so we had to develop, we had to wait for machines that can learn the same way, you know, not necessarily the same way, but at least they have to learn from data because we can't quite tell them what a cat is. Okay? So it's a worthwhile thing to understand that learning from data and demonstrations had to occur for this perceptual intelligence to happen. Now why couldn't we do this before? There is data, but the problem is the data was always being generated, but we didn't have good ways of capturing data. Anytime somebody says the world is now generating a lot more data, I cringe. It's not like people weren't generating data. It's that we did not have infrastructure to capture it and make it available. Enter web. 30 years back, we had a um, you know, World Wide Web starting, and then everybody put their cat pictures on the web, and so there's large number of examples of cats, and so essentially, you can try to see if there's a pattern about cats. Not just cats, they put everything else too on the web. And so, in fact, uh, uh, those of you uh, with a psychology background may know Carl Jung, uh, who essentially talked about collective subconscious. And in essence, World Wide Web became our collective subconscious. You know, so, and by instead of talking to a single person, all the data that's captured on the internet essentially can be used to train. Okay? And so in some sense, actually, the fact that the data became available is the big difference. The technologies that actually are working right now, we'll talk about in a minute, in the deep, lear deep learning technology has been around for quite a while. This is by different uh, reckonings, the third coming of neural networks. The first two times, the difference really was not the major theory, but the fact that captured data was not available. And that's a very interesting point, that, that's a very important point to keep in mind. Now the second is, why did AI catch public imagination now? The way to understand this is to say that AI was a blind and, early AI was a blind and deaf Socrates. Okay, imagine having a kid who can have philosophical discussions with you, but can't see your face, can't smile, can't do much of that kind of stuff. There is very little market for those kinds of kids. And that's why basically evolutionarily we have kind of get the kids who actually have perceptual intelligence first. Um, perceptual abilities allowed AI systems to come to all of us and the part is that now of course we can do image recognition using cell phones, voice recognition using cell phones and then you have Alexas, you have Teslas. So the fact that you could, um, th that an AI system could defeat the uh, grandmaster of chess was useful for a couple of days after that it didn't affect your life in any direct way but now of course the small fruits of AI technology is in everybody's hands and so that sort of made it a lot bigger in, in terms of uh, um, public imagination. And now so people suddenly see AI everywhere which also leads to many misrepresentations and misperceptions in public um, and then the such, which such as exactly when is uh, Terminator scenario going to happen. If you wait until the end, I'll tell you exact date. Um, but so there's also our romance with tacit knowledge and wordless communication that you cannot give up on. Anything that we understand that we can write declaratively, there's no magic. Here's a hint, it's late in the evening, but if somebody asks you, why do you like me so, don't give 10 reasons. Just never works. Just say it's your essential you-ness that makes me like you. That's the tacit circular definition. That's the kind of thing we always fall for, okay, as a human race. And so tacit knowledge and the romance with the tacit knowledge is also important 
in, in understanding why people like the fact that computers can do stuff that we don't know how to teach them. Never mind, they still don't do certain things that we can teach them. So this winds up being an important issue. Um, and, um, and in fact, as Marvin Minsky, who is um, uh, one of the founders of the field, essentially said, with understanding comes a sense of loss. If you know how to do a task, in, in, a, in, in a sense, then you feel there's no magic. Oh, I can actually explain to you how it is done. And thankfully, much of things like vision and speech recognition, we still don't know how to explain how we do it. And so there is perpetual magic there. So that's worthwhile keeping in mind too. Um, so having said that, so success of neural networks, as I said, really depended mostly on, so neural networks is this technology that I won't go into too much detail right now here at all, but it's a technology that existed for a long time. It's a, a simple enough technology that can essentially be stacked. You know, you can have large numbers of parameters that can be tuned slowly, essentially using your calculus to background, gradient descent. And that winds up having um, a big impact. And for the longest time, nobody believed that this will happen because there wasn't enough data and there also wasn't enough compute power. And that wound up changing uh, of late. And so more than the theoretical advances, the fact that the data capture was available wound up changing what we can do. So suddenly, in fact, the people doing neural networks are just as surprised. Uh, those of you who are in technical computer science might know that on the eve of AlexNet, Jeff Hinton gave a Coursera course on neural networks. Listen to it. He is talking about all these great things you have to do to make neural networks work. Turned out none of them was needed. The old ideas from 1980s were enough as long as you have enough data. And that was just as hard for them, for the people in the middle of it, to understand. And so anyway, so neural networks have become multi-layer neural networks have become deep learning, and they have become the workhorse for perceptual intelligence that you keep seeing every day. Um, some impressive feats, those of you who haven't been reading papers, a couple of impressive feats about AI that have been caught people's attention of late. For example, machines can now look at pictures and recognize the objects in it, and he can write also linguistic, you know, language captions approximately. For all of these, these are sort of cherry-picked examples. There are also examples where the captions don't make any sense at all, but you know, they're pretty reasonable, that, pretty impressive that this, this we could do this. Um, they could generate, essentially, distribute, they can learn distribution. So something like human faces is essentially, you know, if it's a 256 by 256 array, it's actually a bigger array anyway. So it's some particular distribution on this 256 by 256 array that corresponds to human faces. Other numbers in these matrices correspond to dog faces. Other numbers might correspond to just white noise. And you are able to learn these distributions well enough, for example, using generative adversarial networks, that you can generate these things which are essentially these are people don't ex th that don't exist. These are faces that were made up based on the faces that the machine was trained on. Okay? Um, you can write text that looks like text that's written by somebody uh, is human. Uh, for example, the GPT-2 system essentially was able to generate, given a prompt, it can write an essay, you know, like the high school students can write. And you can't tell too much the difference uh, up to a certain level. And finally, so much of these are really perception, generating as well as discriminating perception. And then you also have had some uh, interesting examples of uh, combining perception with action. For example, AlphaGo, which you have heard of, where uh, um, unlike uh, uh, after chess, actually the other board game that made a big, uh, that, that obviously, especially in Asian countries, was very popular. Uh, you know, least it all has been defeated, and that was like a big watershed moment. Okay. So, this also caused, because of these particular kinds of things, there is the irrational exuberance in the research community. Um, in particular, uh, you know, Archimedes basically once probably drunk on what are some Greek wine said, if you give me a liver and a place to stand, I can lift the universe. Okay? Um, so now the mantra in AI has become, if you give me a big enough GPU cluster and a large enough data set, and a deep enough network, that means a network with a large number of um, uh, parameters, I will create you super intelligence. Okay? And that has become, uh, there are enough people ready to believe this to some extent, and that's become the kind of scenario here. And you know, this is a sort of thing that 
go self-perpetuating hype to some extent, but keep that in mind. Um, and then of course, there is exuberance in the industry that is an entirely different level. Uh, there's a total land rush mentality to exploit perceptual intelligence technology for everything that you might possibly be doing. Much of it basically involved involves sometimes there are companies which actually have standard operating procedures and they have explicit knowledge, but they'll start an AI group and if you try to use the knowledge they give, they say, oh my God, no, we actually need to somehow learn. If you take anything that people give, that's not considered AI. And so, you know, you have heard of data to knowledge. There are companies right now, many, many companies, which converts knowledge to data so that you can then learn some maybe knowledge from this, okay, which is totally nonsensical, but it's worthwhile keeping in mind. Um, and it's surpri not surprisingly part of this is because of this curve, which basically says a number of US companies um, which were mentioning AI in their uh, earnings calls, earning statement calls. And you notice that around 15, it just basically went up exponentially. So much so that now essentially we think that who cares about who has more nuclear weapons, it matters who has more AI research, China or US or some other country. So we have changed the um, way of looking at the world. Um, this I love actually, 40% um, of the AI startups in Europe apparently are not using any kind of AI. This is the best way to use AI. It's basically put, we are AI powered and so you actually get more venture funding. Um, but also, I also like that everything, if you have data, people will try to use that, especially if you have no theory of how to make the decisions in that field. Uh, it's a great thing. And so as I was coming in the flight, I actually found that India found the real killer application for AI, artificial intelligence helping matrimony sites to suggest matches for life partners. You know, matches made in heaven or any pseudoscience is no comparison to matches made by AI. So, you know, you have that there. So there is this sort of a exuberance and so partly that's part of the reason why everybody is talking about AI. So my question um, in the second part is are we done? You know, is if this looks like this, everybody thinks that AI's big issue is this perceptual intelligence and then there are all these companies being done. So are we almost done? Of course not. If you are thinking in terms of intelligence as in general purpose human intelligence. By the way, you have to understand that in special narrow areas, computers are already outperforming humans forever. And first of all, right, because they are much faster in arithmetic, they're much faster in recognizing up to 200 different breeds of dogs. Uh, this is basically what happens in ImageNet. I don't know why anybody who has a life will actually know how to differentiate between 200 different kinds of uh, uh, dogs, but computers can do that. So they are way more intelligent than humans in recognizing dogs. But when we say intelligence, we mean general intelligence, the ability to do multiple tasks as again as just doing one super narrow task much better than humans, okay? So to do that, there are many thresholds to be crossed. And um, so I want to talk about, of course, the usual things are the, you know, common sense you might have heard about. I, let me talk that, say that, and get it out of the way. It's nice to talk about the fact that computers don't have common sense, and there are multiple ways of making that point. Um, the, my uh, way of doing this is, uh, which trip did Magellan die? Okay, so explorer Magellan, it turns out, went around the world three times. One of his trips, he died. Now comes the pop quiz. Which trip did he die in? Okay? And those of you who are quickly answering this using some sort of uh, calculus, you know, you're in big trouble because you are the robots here. Uh, robots will have trouble because there's nothing in the specification that kind of directly leads to this answer. We have put together variety of pieces of knowledge to say, if he died, then he must have died in second trip, right? Uh, but the point is that common sense is a big missing piece. And you know, you heard about that before. But I want to talk about, among these other things, the handling incomplete models of the world is very important. Sample efficient learning. Learning from few examples is extremely important. You don't want to be shown 10 million examples of dogs before you start learning what dogs are. 
Um, especially the, some of you are teachers. Teachers hate giving examples. Ch you know, students are always saying the teacher talks, 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 and gives just one example in the entire semester. And we are hoping that you are intelligent enough to learn from that one example. But you know, giving learning from few examples winds up being extremely important. And uh, but the two things that I want to spend a little more time on is combining tacit and explicit knowledge, which is the first thing, and the second is interaction with humans, which is closer to my research area. Those are the two things that I want to spend uh, time in the next few minutes. So in terms of combining tacit and explicit knowledge, I mentioned already that perceptual intelligence essentially has happened because machines are able to learn tacit knowledge. Because if you know how to do something, you are better off just telling the machine how to do it. There is no real reason why it has to learn it in an inefficient way from tons and tons of examples. Since the, the main um, engine for tacit knowledge learning after it is deep learning, I want to catch you a couple of things just that might make sense uh, for many of you. One is, of course, to understand that in the deep learning, we are in this look my it works phase. It's a lovely engineering phase. We were building bridges before we understood strength of materials. And it's a very important part of the civilization, but it's worthwhile realizing that we don't quite understand why anything works yet. Uh, one very useful point to remember is that state-of-the-art networks have many more tunable parameters than the data that they use. This is not understood by many people who just hear about the te technology. So for example, the GP2, GPT-2 system that I showed that generates all this text by reading large amounts of um, um, you know, existing text on the uh, web, it basically learns, it, 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 it processes 8 million web pages, but it has 1.5 billion network weights. 1.5 billion network weights. It has so many network weights that it can actually just memorize the data. Memorizing the data is what's called overfitting in machine learning. And that basically you are not learning anything more than the data that I gave you. You have databases that can store the data and give the data back to you. That's not considered learning. You want to be able to generalize from the patterns you have learned. And in general, the biggest worry in, in statistics and machine learning has always been this idea of overfitting. If I give you these uh, green points, you throw a straight line through that, that's basically considered high bias um, way of learning this and basically, but I can, if, if I have, for a line, essentially you have just, in a two dimension, you have just two parameters you are learning. But if instead I say, why don't you fit the best 1500th order polynomial to these points? I can assure you that 1500th point polynomial, um, coefficient polynomial will completely agree with you on the training data, on the green points. And it might also agree on some other points, but it can be completely ununderstandable in the regions where you don't have data. It, that's basically the classic case of overfitting, and you don't know it unless that it's actually happening. Uh, and I'll show you some examples as to why this might be currently happening. So this should normally be a recipe for overfitting, but somehow it doesn't seem to be, and people are so happy about it. Okay? But it's not actually clear that the overfitting is not happening. So I'll show you some examples that tell you that, in fact, uh, much of the perceptual knowledge right now might actually be quite uh, um, susceptible to these kind of problems. So uh, an example some of you might be familiar with is this whole idea of adversarial examples in machine learning, um, where so you have a school bus. I added some noise, and I get this picture which, as every one of you can recognize, even in the evening, is an ostrich. OK? This dog, I add some noise. I get this picture, which again is an ostrich. I say this because the state of the art perceptual learning systems, the deep networks, will essentially consider these two to be essentially ostriches. OK? Now, here's the thing. It's possible that unbeknownst to you, the place is teeming with ostriches. You just didn't notice it. It's also true that we have a perceptual system that is not foolproof. I don't know how many of you have seen this picture before. How many of you have seen this picture before? OK. So this is a picture that became popular a couple of years back in Norway, um, where some right-wing nuts basically took this picture and said, oh my god, Norway is being taken over by burqa-clad Muslim women. And we need to stop these crazy immigrants from coming into our country. 
Now you look at this, you look at this, and I'm hoping that you can see what actually is there in that picture. You might feel sorry for the bigoted, bigoted people who said that. But you can almost at least understand why they thought a normal city bus seat, when seen at a certain angle, looks like a burqa clad woman. woman. Okay? Now that I told you this is an ostrich, do you see why it is an ostrich? How about this? This is my point about failure modes. When the perceptually intelligent systems agree with you, you are happy, you celebrate. When they disagree with you, in this case through a adversarial examples, but in fact I will show you in a minute that in fact they can also happen in lots of other regions, it basically you have no explanation as to why they are doing what they are doing. And that's not to be surprised because it's a complete, we never told them what makes a dog a dog. We just collectively agree on dogness. And all we know is giving examples. And we are hoping that the machine has figured this out and that's not obvious. Um, so what's happening here essentially is it agreed in a whole bunch of points, the, the model that you learned, but might have kind of done all sorts of crazy things in regions where it's clearly a, a school bus and a clearly a dog a puppy and still the machine is even more certain that it is ostrich than it was certain that this was a school bus and this was a puppy. That's the kind of technology that is currently being used right now. And this is not to put down my field, it is just to tell you that there are certain things we don't yet understand. Okay, so if you're thinking, well, that's just adversarial examples, and now that's like somebody actually put specific kinds of changes to the image that are imperceptible to you, but the machine somehow thinks that's a completely different thing. Here's a paper that just came out, uh, it's going to be uh, published in iClear um, uh, by these guys, who talks about excessive invariance. So all machine learning systems are supposed to be having some invariance. So if you, a cat rotated should not suddenly become a clock, right? A cat rotated should be a rotated clock, a cat, okay? But if you're totally excessively invariant, then the cat becomes a desk, you still say it is a cat. And that's no good, okay? And so here is a set of examples. See all these examples. Do you see anything common between them? They're completely different objects, according to most of you. And they showed that all these examples give from top one to thousand ranking as to their best guess as to what it is. All of these examples are top one uh, guess is bullfrog, thousandth guess is tiger shark, and one to thousand is exactly the same ordering. Same ordering. What is happening here in essence is that there is so many variables which are these pixels that might be interestingly uh, correlated with each other, and we are looking at a multiple different semantic features to decide whether or not something is a cat, but we don't know what the semantic features are. But the machine somehow is essentially looking at one set of features that is able to get it to differentiate um, the cats from dogs in the training data, and that's enough, okay? Um, given this, um, in fact, when, when the adversarial examples came up, uh, it was seen too much, somewhat, to some extent as some sort of a um, uh, wasted time. It's like some kind of a, um, some kind of a, um, a boutique uh, examples, but now it's become increasingly clear that these are actually serious, deeper uh, rooted problems. So here I want to talk to you about this idea of data versus doctrine tension or Polanyi's uh, revenge. Um, so Polanyi is this philosopher uh, who basically has been always talking about the fact that human civilization mostly focused on explicit knowledge. Until very recently, we focused mostly on explicit knowledge and didn't study enough about how to get the tacit knowledge because nobody knows how to teach that. So machine learning, of course, changed that. Um, but Polanyi's paradox is we know more than we can tell, and currently in, your, in AI, essentially, it's interesting to note that much of the recent progress has basically just focused only on tacit knowledge. So if you happen to know how to do a task, you are better off converting that into a huge number of examples and giving it to machine, if you just use deep learning technology. That sort of makes no sense. So uh, what, if we, what do we do when we actually have doctrine that we want the systems to follow? And one of the hallmarks of human intelligence is the seamless interplay of both tacit and explicit knowledge. You are able to combine both of them, but in AI, the pendulum has swung from all models are wrong and some are useful to what are models? What is anything that you can tell me? Just give me data and I'll try to find patterns, and that's not necessarily 
a good uh, direction. Uh, so, in fact, the ramifications of Polanyi's revenge really correspond to a bunch of things that you might have heard about. One that AI systems have interpretability problem. Somehow they do things that you don't understand. All computer programs can have interpretability problem, but you can actually see how the code led him to that particular decision. But in the case of in the case of things like adversarial examples that I've shown, it's very hard to explain exactly why the system actually thinks that particular image is a uh, is an ostrich. If you ask it for an explanation, the best it can do is make some. You know, the, the best people have done is to show here are the regions that makes it look like an ostrich. And what regions in that picture of a puppy make it look like an ostrich? What regions in that picture of a uh, school bus make it look like an ostrich? If you go with the tacit knowledge, you don't give explanations. You never ask anybody, why did you think this, you th why did you think this person is Tom? You don't ask that question. Okay, whereas you do ask them, why did you think it's a smart idea to get the car in the morning instead of taking public transport? And then there is an answer to that, for example. So this, the interpretability bugaboo is completely connected to the fact that we are basically focusing on tacit knowledge, which is where the representations are being learned from the data and they are not accessible to you. And the representations you have, you don't know, and all you can say is whether or not we agree, and that points up being an issue. Susceptibility to adversarial attacks follows from that because there are just so many different ways you can look at these examples and so there are many different small things that you can do such that the system gets affected. So this has led to all sorts of worries about security of AI. In fact, yesterday somebody showed from Tencent Labs, I think, uh, from China that Tesla autopilot can be fooled multiple different ways in, into thinking, um, you know, in, into looking at the lane markings and so on. And humans, when I say fooled, it's, these are the cases where, so for example, this one is a you know, turn sign, but the machine actually, with a small change, it looks at it as a completely different traffic sign. Now, this is not surprising anymore if you can think of a, um, you know, an, a, a puppy as an ostrich and a school bus as an ostrich, this is not surprising to you at all, that you can do this. And as a credit to AI community, actually, we are very busy. People are very busy looking for multiple different ways of breaking the systems. But it's, there's a you know, bottomless pit in some sense in, in figuring out all the different ways you can uh, break this. And then finally, to susceptibility to data set bias. This is something that I want to kind of touch on uh, because this is, we may not have too much time to talk about the societal impacts later on, but it's worthwhile to realize that if you think that some technology can learn tacit knowledge for which you don't know why, what the theory is, there is a tendency to believe the technology. And this can be pretty darn bad. Let me show you an example. So this one is known as, this is actually a data set bias problem where essentially people have shown, for example, that machines have difficulty figuring out the gender of the person unless the person is white male. Okay, if you are not white and you are not male, then it can, depending on how far you are from that, um, the guesses of gender, which is something that we take for granted, can go away. Okay, and that's because of the data on which they got trained. Um, here is a great example, a couple of years back, as I submitted to CVPR as a paper, where somebody said, hey, we have data set. Remember in AI, the big mantra is, what's your data set? So somebody figured out, they got uh, police mug shots from some Chinese county, and uh, they trained a system to differentiate between people who have been caught and normal people. And thereby, you can see, is there something that you can see from the faces to predict whether or not you'll be a criminal? <laughs> Remember, we did phrenology, we did astrology, we did palmistry, we now do AI, okay, for this kind of a thing, okay? Now, Clearly, for some reason, CVPR didn't want to accept this paper, but the important point is on the held out data set, these guys had some 97% accuracy. You just hope that you don't look like the bad guys that they think you are. Okay? And then you might think, oh, China, what, what China? This is an Israeli company which can look at your face and then look at terrorists and pedophiles just by face. Notice you've been doing this all along. You know, let's not kid ourselves. In the night, late night, when you're passing somebody by, you say, eh, I should run away right now. Okay? This is what we evolved to do. We evolved to fight or flight. Okay? 
but we don't take credit for doing this. The civilization was to try and sort of put a rein on these crazy impulses. So there is that, and uh, of course there is some other company which says how a high classifier, our classifiers will show who has high IQ, who is an academic researcher. You see, it looks like me, and then professional poker player and and a terrorist, which also unfortunately looks like me. Um, so. This is where I sort of decided the other day that it's enough time has been spent wasting about all, all these things. I, the problem for you know, teachers, we love to talk, we hate to grade. Okay, so, <laughs> so what I decided is I'm going to use AI technology. I have mug shots of various students who have taken the intro to AI class over years and I know the grades I gave them. So I'm going to train a multi-layer convolutional neural network then I'm done. Essentially, I take your snapshot of your picture and I'll give you the grade at the end of the semester. Right? Now, if you think this is crazy, there's a whole bunch of these kinds of things that are being done. And it's, again, I don't know how it is done. Let's hope the machine knows. What do you think is happening when you say machines have higher accuracy on recognizing medical images compared to human doctors? Do you think human doctors should be out of a job? Uh, given that machines can actually get into these kinds of issues, it's something that you want to keep in mind. To some extent, I'm sort of pushing back the hype uh, and saying that it's, there is all these possible ways in which systems can be uh, violated. So, um, so for a while, actually, I decided that this, between this um, 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 tacit knowledge and expert knowledge problem, I decided that we need a serenity play, prayer for robots. You know, the serenity prayer in Christianity says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And the robot version of this is human grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot learn from you, and data to learn the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Okay? And to some extent, that's like a catchphrase way of basically summarizing the stuff. You know, just because you have a data and you have no theory, Let's hope that convolutional network will tell me what is the theory is kind of strange. Okay? That's what I want to keep in mind. So the next part that hopefully is the only one that I get to talk about is interaction with humans. I will have to go through it more quickly. Um, the thing that, that has always surprised me is of all the breaking news about AI, the kind of news that I always liked is this kind of news. AI helps old lady cross the street, plays with kids, cooks food, and hangs around sans drama. So you <coughs> probably are wondering, how come you didn't see this news? Because it's fake news. <coughs> it doesn't ex exist. Somehow we don't seem to take AI systems getting along with people that much, you know, um, uh, importance. We don't give it that much importance. So AI's curious ambivalence to humans is something that we should talk about. Our systems, AI systems seem to be happiest either far away from humans, um, like on Mars, are in an adversarial stance with humans while beating them in chess, beating them in Go, beating them in poker, and then we are surprised that the normal people on the street are very afraid of AI technology. If all the things you are doing is beating them, then is there any surprise that they are afraid of AI technology? So actually John Lennon once said, you want to help humanity, it's the people that you just can't stand, and you probably you can say that to some extent about AI technology uh, for the longest time. And um, so one worry, of course, is uh, isn't interacting with humans cheating. In the beginnings of AI, people were very worried about letting humans to take part in you know, AI-human interactions because maybe the humans will do all the work and the AI system is not doing anything at all. That's currently Sophia the robot, by the way. I hope those of you who think Sophia the robot is an actual AI technology, please understand that's total prestidigitation. It's really, it's like a, essentially a puppet. Okay, and uh, original Mechanical Turk, not the Amazon one, the original Mechanical Turk, which went from uh, a European king to another European king's court, was essentially had a little Turk sitting inside who would provide all the intelligence. And so there were real reasons to worry that if you put humans in the loop, they will do the hard work and the machine actually does nothing. But honestly, we have gone much farther now, and so in fact, you know, a couple of years back when I got to give the uh, presidential, uh, uh, AAAI presidential address, I talked about these challenges of human aware AI systems and talked about why isn't human aware AI all over the place already, why should we pursue it, and what are some of the research challenges, and I want to give you a small summary of that here. Uh, the first thing that I want to mention is that putting humans in the loop with AI systems 
makes the problem harder. Researchers are masochists. They want harder problems to solve. If it is easier, then oh, somebody else will solve, my students will solve. I'm telling you that having humans in the loop makes the problem much harder. Um, so in fact, there is a evolutionary theory that says that we have the brains that we have compared to our evolutionary uh, siblings, much bigger brains that we have, not to run away from the tigers or lions, but to deal with each other. Because we are continually modeling each other's mental states and trying to figure out what are they thinking, what should I be doing to cooperate with them, compete with them, and so on. And that winds up being important. So in fact, there's this old thing called Sally Ann test that you know, is given to see the kid's ability to model the other. And here, I'll see how many of you will pass this. So the Sally comes into the room, puts a ball in the yellow box, and then goes away. Uh, then Ann moves the box from yellow to the white box. Now um, Sally comes in. Where will Sally look for the ball? OK, this is like the second part of the Magellan test. Um, if you are below three years old, I'm not surprised if you haven't got the answer. But if you're above three years old, I'm surprised if you don't get the answer. The interesting thing is there's actually a transition period. Kids actually have trouble solving the Sally Ann test below three years old. And above three years old, they actually realize that their mental model. So the problem that the kids have is they see this picture. They really know where the ball is. And because they know where the ball is, they assume everybody else knows where the ball is, which means Anna, Sally should also know where the ball is, and so Sally should look at the white box. The moment the kids realize that that's not, that makes no sense, they know how to lie. <laughs> which is why I was the happiest when my kid told the first lie, because I knew he has a brain. Okay? <laughs> because being able to tell lies is essentially a higher form of cognition you are actually able to realize, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding, this is serious, okay? Because you are able to man, manipulate other people's mental models and you realize that your mental model is different from the other people's mental models. Lying is harder than not lying. Um, so anyway, so HAI of course, you know, you, even if you don't want to tell lies, essentially you do want uh, lots of places where AI systems have to get along with humans, there's intelligent tutoring systems, there's social robotics, but even quotidian systems, like systems that will assist humans you know, instead of computer human interaction, human computer interaction, you have human AI interaction because the computer systems will increasingly have AI capabilities. And then you want to be able to do teaming in factory floors or in search and rescue kinds of scenarios, you want the machines to be able to team with humans. And increasingly, HCI will be human AI interaction. And in those cases, you want to be able to do this thing. Now, the question is what changes? Yeah, it turns out that this is sort of the block diagram that we show about the intelligent agent design for uh, you know, intro to AI classes. If you put humans in the loop, pretty much everything changes. Because you have to not only look at your own model of the world, but you have to look at uh, the effect your actions have in the human's model of you as well as the human's um, mental um, um, models. And, and so that changes everything. And so the what I want to say a few things about is how does it change in the context of AI systems synthesizing their behavior, deciding how, what they do, the planning aspect when they are in the context of humans, because that's my area, on, on automatic planning. And uh, so it turns out it requires modeling and managing the human's uh, mental state and modeling and managing human's model of the AI system itself. And we work in these kinds of things in two kinds of scenarios. One is uh, human-robot interaction of the kind that's shown in this video, and this is the human AI software interaction where there's a decision support system where the humans are in the steering wheel, but the machines are actually helping the humans. As again, is taking the initiative away and solving the problem themselves. And those of you who are teachers know that it's harder to get somebody to do something right than to just do it yourself. Oftentimes, you would like to take the steering away and just do it yourself. But it's actually harder to do this correctly in terms of decision support, and that's the kind of thing that we look at. Um, uh, I'll probably skip on this because this is slightly more abstract, but essentially it turns out that you will, normal mo systems will essentially have one model of the world with respect to which they are getting their behavior, single agents. When you have humans in the loop, they not only have their own model, but they have to look at the humans' intentions. What are they trying to do? What are their goals? So that you can help them on the side. And in fact, they also need to figure out what the humans think about 
their intentions and their capabilities. And this second level, in fact, there may be an infinite regress, but the second level winds up being extremely important in doing explicable behavior, that is behavior that doesn't surprise the human in the loop, are providing explanations when your behavior you think would not be in conformance with the human's model of the world. So it turns out that human AI interaction winds up being this multi-model reasoning, modeling with your own, uh, reasoning with your own model, but also the human's model. Um, so I want to show you a couple of uh, examples here for the, you know, for the human's model of uh, their intentions and beliefs, for example. So this one, there's a lot of work that goes on in, you know, some of our work, we basically look at intention recognition. With, you can do it with a language, but in our case, we are also doing it with some of these uh, newer technologies like uh, Emotive, which is the brain you know, computer interface. This is a cheap one, not like the neural link that, uh, um, you know, that uh, Elon Musk is trying to fund, which will actually read your brain completely, sort of, supposedly. But even with that, you are able to actually get, in this particular case, this guy is trying to say, I keep, I'll, I'm reserving one block, and then he's essentially making sure that the machine is able to then decide that, okay, I'm going to keep that block out and then work on something else. And when he realizes this, uh, he's very happy that he's gotten his um, word across. Okay, so that's kind of a thing. The other one, intention projection, the computer can say where it is going. The AI system can say where it is going in terms of this is the area. Uh, so this one, we actually use HoloLens to sort of give the human both the normal vision as well as additional augmented vision. And there, for example, the computer can say, this is all the regions where my hand can hit you, so get out of these particular kinds of regions. And here, for example, the computer is saying, I want to use this box, ball, so don't, don't use that, no, keep me that box, okay? Um, the other thing that I want to mention with respect to the explicability part, let me go, because we're running out of time, I want to show you actually an example. Um, so let's look at this example, um, which should work, right? I'm sorry. Um, so, if this works, yeah. So, what happens in this particular example is this, the, using this example, I can get you a sense across that. So, here, the, both the AI system and the human start with the same map of the environment. It turns out that in a kind of a search and rescue scenario, some particular regions that the human thought would be clear might actually be not clear. In this case, we have put a, a, like a fake obstacle. Because of that obstacle, the shortest path the computer can take no longer is available. But the human expects that, that the machine will take that shortest path. In those cases, you have two options. One is to do what the human expects, which is explicable behavior, where you sort of remove the obstacle and go through the direction that the human expects. So whenever you are working with other people, if their model of what you are doing is different from what you actually want to do, there are two options you can do. One is to do what they're expecting, which is explicable behavior, in which case you don't have to open your mouth because that's what they expected, so you did that. But sometimes doing that can be costly in terms of your own optimality criterion. In that particular case, then you are better off, in this example what's happening is the system essentially decided, I'm not going to do that other part of removing the obstacle. I will take the what is the next shortest path, but give an explanation to the human as to why I am doing something different. And the explanation here turns out to be the difference that the computer thinks is the difference between its model of the world and the human's model of the world. So explanations are really should be seen as a process of reconciling human and machine models. So that's what we wind up doing. Uh, I would skip over the technical details here and I want to show you this, that explanations can be, as really should be seen as model reconciliation. If somebody asks you, why did you do this, talking to yourself doesn't help. You need to understand why they misunderstood your behavior to begin with and make sense in terms of the changes that they have to make to their model so that your behavior becomes optimal in the changed model. And so these are better than the pointing kind of explanations. These obviously have better properties than the pointing kind of explanations in the visual tasks that we looked at. And so that's something, and also these kinds of explanations have psychological validity um, in the sense of, uh, psychologists have talked about the kinds of explanations people, um, you know, uh, 
exchange and the model reconciliation explanations actually have some connections to that. Um, again, the different kinds of explanations that people give also can be seen as different computational ways of computing explanations that we look at in our papers. Um, let me see. And, uh, and in terms of giving explanation actually turns out to be a combinatorial search in the space of models between the one that the, uh, the robot has and the one that the machine has, which is a hard process. Providing explanations are, is not easy, but it's a meta search and we can improve that using some uh, structure of the search process. That's again a uh, thing that I wanted to say. And the, the, la the last thing I want to say here is explicability and explanation are not two completely different things. Sometimes I can get you halfway closer to my model and then do what you expect in this changed model. So that we split the difference in terms of what's hard for me versus what I have to explain. And so that is actually combining explicability and explanation and that also can be done in the same kind of a uh, search process. Um, and in fact, doing this involves typically what are called epistemic actions, actions that communicate model differences as part of the plan. For example, we do this, we kind of foreshadow, now I'm going to do this and I'll do that before saying that, okay? Um, and turns out that this explicable explanation was sort of the uh, tip of the iceberg and there's a whole bunch of things that you can do in that context to make human AI interaction better. So we look at how to handle multiple humans, looking at models that are at different levels of abstraction and also learning how to project intentions, you know, planning how to project your intentions. Those are some of the things that we do in this. And so we can actually, you know, in, in a uh, software system kind of a thing, you can have two different uh, uh, people looking at the same interface but having different explanations being given because they're being given different views of the interface as well as different explanations. Um, one other thing, of course, is when you do this with the humans in the loop, how do you know that this is actually helpful to the humans? I can say, well, I'm a human. And so I think it's kind of helpful to me, so it's good. But that, you know, I kind of say that engineers saying they represent humanity is a bit of an oxymoron because, you know, to some extent we have all these stereotypes about engineers. And so the real thing, of course, is anytime you have AI human interaction, the evaluation changes. It has to be actually human, you know, controlled human studies. And so we actually work with human factors faculty. And one of the things I can tell you is the kind of explanations that we produce have been shown to have, um, in, in, in a control studies with the human subjects, we've shown both that uh, humans provide the kinds of explanations that we are computing as model reconciliation and that the need to give explanations reduces if they show explicable behavior, just as what I expected. This sounds like obvious, but until you do that, you know for sure, you know. So this sort of makes AI and uh, human factors, human computer interaction people closer. It becomes a more interdisciplinary issue. Uh, this AI systems working with humans also has many implications for trust in autonomy. This is another of the things that people keep worrying about. You know, systems are doing decisions. How do I know how to trust and so on? Trust is a long-term concept. It's a longitudinal concept based on multiple interactions. But while I don't have a direct theory of how to get trust, doing inexplicable things and providing poor explanations will certainly get into the way of the humans trusting you. So this is sort of a part of the answer to the trust uh, in autonomy. So I kind of think that I got um, basically in this human AI interaction, it looked like the problem became harder and just to get the humans into the loop, um, but it's worthwhile because we really want this technology to work with us. Why design a future where essentially AI systems do everything and we have no role, all we do is, you know, complain that we don't seem to have any role. Instead, we should actually design a future where AI and systems and humans work together. It's sort of a great way of augmented intelligence, IA as against AI sort of a thing. Okay. Um, so the last, can I, who is keeping time? Uh, can I take a f four more minutes and then just show some of the, and then, then we can do it. So last thing I want to talk about is some thoughts on managing risks and rewards of AI. This is again the kind of stuff that, you know, close to popular imagination. Even though I might have sounded some untrained eyes as I'm kind of complaining about AI, despite being an AI guy, I want to show that I'm a rah-rah cheerleader for AI technology. You see the blue skies, green hills, and beautiful water. 
the future is great with the AI technologies being used. There are lots and lots of interesting places. AI uh, systems can help us in quality of life, universal access, uh, social good, intelligence augmentation of the kind that I'm talking about. But, so, on one hand, you can, AI technology as it progresses, currently, you know, the things that everybody is using is this kind of conversational jobs can be sort of automated, let's say, uh, because of chatbots and, you know, uh, sorts of things. Um, then you can maybe get into transactional jobs, then you get into successful human AI cooperation of the kind that I'm talking about. All of that is good, but all technologies are dual use technologies and intelligence is the ultimate dual use technology. And so, you can have the negative side of all these technologies. And so, for example, you can have fake reality. Um, you know, people are talking about fake news. I think this morning I saw in Straits Times that you guys have passed a law to outlaw fake news. Good luck with that because essentially AI systems are generating a lot more uh, reality that you can't tell between real versus unreal. Um, so, fake reality, you can worry about biases and manipulations. Uh, you might be worried about technological unemployment. And then if you are uh, uh, Nick Bostrom, you will be worried about uh, R. Elon Musk, unsuccessfully human AI cooperation, which involves humanity kind of being put to end. Um, I don't believe in that part, but there are certain things that are negative things that can happen. Uh, so AI kind of opens a whole bunch of new attack surfaces. Those of you who may not have seen this cartoon, please see this. this is an amazing cartoon of Internet of Things, all of them ra you know, demanding ransom from you. Um, but essentially, you can do voice spoofing, you can do image spoofing, you can do identity spoofing, um, and so that can have huge amounts of impacts. I said much of the big difference that happened in AI recently is perceptual intelligence, but we did say perception is reality. We keep saying perception is reality. So if perception is reality, perception has now become fake reality because we can generate you know, uh, what you are seeing. And so I can gen there are great examples that people talk about. You can have driving, you know, if you have like a scene which is with, with sunlit, then you can see how that scene might look, in, you know, pot potentially look in spring, in night and so on. You can have Obama say anything that you want him to say. You can have Trump say anything you want him to say. He probably does it anyway. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can have, uh, you know, tech basically uh, passages written by GPT-2 GPT system, um, which basically cannot be told from real passages. So much so that uh, OpenAI basically said, we're not going to release the model that we learned because we want to help universal peace. Uh, which is like a great way of getting extra publicity for your technology as it turns out. But it's a prop thing to worry about. There is a, some of you probably know this site which says uh, this uh, fake or not, where there are two pictures here. One of them is AI generated, one of them is not. And you have to figure out which one. If you actually go to this site, um, basically you can play this for a long time. And you will figure out right now which one is which for a while, but then this is a moving target and it becomes harder and harder to tell the difference. I don't know if there are some old people here. There was a old show called Moonlighting with Sybil Shepherd and um, Bruce Willis. I see Steve uh, nodding his head away. And at one, you know, one episode, magician tells Maddie that people would be much harder to fool if only they didn't have eyes to be sure with. We keep saying random things like seeing is believing. Forget that. Seeing is not at all believing. Okay? Seeing plus humongous amount of you know, provenance technology is maybe believing. That's the world that you are going to get into very soon. And there is no simple way of stopping that world from happening by fiat. And that's worthwhile keeping in mind. So, and also Charlie Chaplin um, once took part in the Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest and came in second or 20th. Um, you know, depending on whose story you heard. And I believe that in future we'll all be Charlie Chaplin's being coming perpetually second to a better AI technology fake version of us. And so the question then is what does it mean to talk about whether something happened or not when there's so many different ways of rendering uh, that event separately. Um, you know this, this guy is talking every day on Chinese news and this is a completely uh, generate, uh, 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 GAN generated um, video, essentially, which just says what the, that you are asking that particular actor, that, that particular AI avatar to say. And you can't tell the difference between a normal, um, you know, um, news anchor and this, apparently, surprisingly. Um, so you saw that this is today's news. Um, we can talk also about uh, this whole entire 
technological unemployment issues. I actually am skeptical that AI is going to be a huge difference to this age old problem of whether technology will displace employment possibilities. But even if you do worry, it's worthwhile keeping this thing that's well known to people that routine, non routine cognitive manual. It's not cognitive that matters, it is routine versus non routine that matters. If you're doing anything, that even if you are being paid very well, but you are doing the same thing again and again and again, maybe machines can do better than you very soon. Okay, which actually might change our societal values because you pay very little to the person who takes care of your elderly parents during the whole day, but yet you pay a whole lot to a radiologist who keeps on looking at x-rays. Which job is going to go away faster? So this, remember that doctors may be easier to replace than nurses. Okay? And that might change the way society values different kinds of um, you know, services. That's a worthwhile thing, actually. Um, and then the other thing about bias, the one piece that I want to remember, hopefully, that I want you to keep, keep in mind is, please don't say algorithmic bias. It's all about data bias, and that's the harder thing to fix. A stupid algorithm with a bug, it's not bias. It's just a buggy algorithm. Okay, the whole of computer science is trying not to write buggy algorithms. Okay, the problems that are harder to fix are tacit knowledge learned from data that is not representative. Okay, my classic example of this is there was a, for a while back, Samsung had these cameras that had blink detection feature. Okay, and you know what happened. Essentially, these cameras will say anybody from Asian origin, Chinese origin especially, that you're blinking, you're blinking, you're blinking. Right? Now, of course, you could say Samsung is a racist company, but why the heck will Samsung be racist? It's a Korean company. It sees people around it. Right? They took the data that is easily available, that happened to be essentially Western European data. And they train their system. They hope that the system will learn something about what a blink is, and that wound up making a difference. Even today, if you want to somehow crazily predict whether somebody is a professor or not, by training uh, on professor data from Google Images, go to Google Images as you speak, as I'm speaking right now, and say, you know, say professor, most of the people will be bald white males. Okay? So there are all sorts of interesting issues about data bias is the harder thing to fix. It's not easy. If it, it's not a problem, it can be fixed. Debugging is a problem. I mean, debugging is not real. Debugging, there's, a, there's an art for you know, debugging. So we don't talk about algorithmic bias. Data bias is a harder problem because we don't quite know how to change the system to work right in those cases. You at least can avoid being egregiously wrong by training only on Western Europeans and trying to predict on um, in Indians or Chinese. Okay? Um, so that's something that's worthwhile keeping in mind. The other thing I think of is when Martin Luther King once said that um, AI, that he basically decided to put the civil rights on the TV, and he said this, that let me put what's happening on the streets into the living rooms of everybody. And if the society is happy with it, it's not going to change. If on the other hand, when they see it, they are not happy, they might change. And he was right. The society was not happy. It was just easy to ignore something that you are not seeing every day. By showing the biased decisions that we are all doing ourselves in different, different places, AI can put a mirror to our own society. And in that sense, it can actually be a force for the good. It's not that we are not doing biased decisions. We are doing all sorts of biased decisions. We never explain that I did that. I thought you are going to be um, like an unsafe person, so I ran away from you because you look like a guy from Pedapuram, which is my hometown. And, and so that's why you ran away from me. That's not, you never would say that. Instead, you will come up with a much more interesting uh, an explanation. The last thing, even something as nice as humans and machines getting along, the thing that I said as if it's like a nice kumbaya kind of a thing that you should be working on, it too can cause ethical quandaries. Mental modeling is the way you manipulate other people's beliefs. And so, if a system can model, you know, uh, the mental model of the humans, it can tell them lies. And you can actually do real manipulation, not the kind of small things with the humans in the background manipulating voter perceptions on Facebook. Its AI systems are just given a high-level uh, suggestion by Putin saying, you know, change this country's election and you'll just do it. 
it will basically model every individual person's mental uh, model and then use that to lie to them in a convincing way. And so you have to worry about that kind of ethical quandaries that you know, AI human interaction will bring in. Uh, in fact, our own work, this, this AAAI showed that the same technology with a small flip of switch can be made to make an AI system either cooperate and make the human know what it's trying to do or completely confuse them and obfuscate its behavior. It's very simple. It's both the two sides of the same coin. And, uh, and then we also have shown, we actually then looked at this issue of when will it be reasonable from the human's point of view, from people's point of view, to have AI systems tell them white lies. You know, in social fabric, we are always telling each other's lies uh, to kind of, you know, white lies mostly to kind of help them or to at least avoid social gaffes. So the question is, when do you want AI systems to do that? It's actually, they can do it already. And so we have a paper that looked at some works on that. Of course, uh, that got some press saying the AI bots are now lying. The AI bots can lie, of course, if you can do um, uh, mental modeling. Uh, so I want to end with saying that these are bigger problems. And so, for example, in ASU, we had this workshop that looked at uh, AI adversarial outcomes, um, that, and anticipating adversarial outcomes, and uh, finding ways to ameliorate that. And so we kind of looked at variety of ways in which you can solve some of these issues. They're not, they're all open problems, but it's worthwhile thinking about it. Um, and then AI, the AAAI, which when I was the president, we started this conference called AI Ethics and a Society. You know, we were interested in uh, societal impacts all along, but society didn't care about us uh, because AI was like one more so for technology. But now society thinks AI is the be all and end all technology, so we should care about our impacts. And so there's a sister conference for AAAI, which we started two years back, that looks at some of these issues in a technical, both from a technical and interdisciplinary perspective. Um, I also served as a board of director for Partnership for AI, which also looks at some of these issues on impacts of AI technology in terms of safety, criticality, fair and transparent accountable AI and labor and so on, a bunch of the things that we looked at. These are some of the beginnings of people taking these things seriously. So I want to end and um, say that, you know, having made most progress on the declarative tasks, AI systems in recent years have found significant success in learning tacit knowledge from data. This has led to some interesting ramifications both within and outside the field. There is irrational exuberance of various kinds both within and outside, and I tried to get you to understand some of that. We're still far from general intelligence. Significant thresholds remain to be crossed, and the most important one that I talked about from my point of view is both combining tacit and explicit knowledge and also the human-aware AI systems. And then AI remains a potent tool as well as a weapon, and the new breakthroughs per se pro provide both risks and rewards, and we need to worry. Um, so, of course, this is a bunch of my students, my robots. I leave you to figure out which is which. And I want to end with Pandora's box. I want to end with Pandora's box. Um, everybody talks about Pandora's box. You know, anytime you don't like some technology, oh my God, why did you open the Pandora's box? We opened it. Get over it. Okay. But here is the deal. People don't read the rest of Pandora's box. After Pandora opened the box and the demons flew away, she finds hope in the box. Go check the thing. I still think there's a lot of hope about using AI technology wisely, and you just have to be careful about how you do it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Professor Rao. Ladies and gentlemen, the question and answer session is now open. Please identify yourselves and the organization that you are from before posing your questions to the speaker. And may I suggest that those with questions to start queuing behind the microphones along the aisles. And now, can we also welcome on stage Professor Lily Kong, who will be moderating the question and answer session. Professor Kong and Prof Rao, please. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you very much. Would you join me once again in thanking Prof Rao for a very stimulating lecture? I think you will agree with me that he's given us a lot of food for thought. Um, and even though he went a little bit longer than we had scheduled, I thought it was just so fascinating that we should do that. But what it does mean is that it's uh, shortened a little bit the question and answer time. So I think we have about 15 minutes 
And uh, as Kimberly said, please do introduce yourselves very, very quickly and be as crisp as possible with your comment and questions so that we can take as many as possible. Any immediate takers? There, there is one coming up, and while that happens, um, let, let me just, yes, okay, you're ready to go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, I'm, hi. I'm Sheldon, I'm a, a student at SMU. So I was just wondering, what, what are your thoughts on, on China's progression in AI? Um, I think there's a lot of talk about this arms race between the state and then China, but I know it's not a zero-sum game, right? So what, what, just what are your thoughts about their progression there? Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? So I, I think it's part of the, the same kind of a hype. I don't really see how you can say that I, there's some, let me say some positive things about China. Um, when in AAAI, which is one of the conferences that I'm most familiar with, uh, some years back there used to be very few papers uh, from China. Now there are equal number of accepted papers, and their citations are also going up. So it's great that there is another country which has first-rate research program in AI. To me, that's like a positive thing. The thing that I don't understand is this issue. Uh, AI is not nuclear weapon technology by any means. And in fact, it's open enough that really I do not believe, personally I don't believe, that countries have monopoly on it right now. Uh, because to some extent, learned models are actually, you know, you know that you can download pre-trained trunks. First of all, much of this is really about this perceptual intelligence part and who has the bigger network and who has trained a larger network to kind of do predict various things. I don't really personally think that that's just one angle and you know what I see it as a positive thing that there's one more country that was not really well known for its AI research or applications which is joining the fray. Um, to me that's not an issue. I do think um, that the place where I'm coming from in US, uh, there's the AI research support has sort of taken a little bit of a backseat of late because of other political things. It would be nice if we too actually bring it back to the front seat, but I don't really believe in if there's more AI for China, there's less AI for US or less AI for Singapore. And, and, and in fact, a lot of this is open research. In fact, anybody is actually capable of doing adversarial examples for example, and that doesn't quite require you know, humongous uh, infrastructure support. Uh, uh, so Hoon, Professor of Philosophy. Yes. Uh, Tan So Hoon from School of Social Sciences. So um, emotional intelligence is important for human AI cooperation, but will AI have to have actual emotions to have emotional intelligence, and is that possible? So when you have, you're saying if, Showing emotions or, I'm sorry. Actually having emotions. Okay, so actually, so this is a very interesting question. Um, the jury is, so as to why we have emotions is not well understood at all. From what I can tell, it's still not, I mean, as you know, saying you are too emotional is never like a positive thing to say for some strange reason. Okay, despite the fact that we are all emotional beings, Somehow saying you are too emotional is the way of putting down. And we don't somehow understand how emotions play a role in general intelligence. The closest thing that I've heard is emotions wind up sort of doing a damping factor in certain cases. So there's this great ex experiment that I know of where they showed that sociopaths playing a lottery that is stacked against them will continue to play and lose all their money. Whereas normal people, without quite realizing why, will start having this foreboding feeling and stop playing that lottery. So there, for example, that's like the best example I know of where emotions sort of directly helpful. The jury is completely out on whether or not AI systems need emotions to be able to show intelligent behavior if they're hanging out on Mars. But they certainly should show the right emotional response when they are interacting with humans. So once again, human AI interaction in that place 
if you just don't show the right emotions at the right time, we get turned off like crazy. If I stub my toe and the robot has like a funny expression, I'll throw the robot out the window, at least when I have the chance, right? Um, so I think we are slaves to reading emotional responses and expecting right emotional responses. And so this is one case where AI systems have to show the right emotional responses. Are they feeling it? That's an entirely different question in terms of they are not carbon life forms. They're not necessarily going to have the same kind of quote unquote feelings that we might have. Um, but to be able to cooperate with them, you have to, they have to be able to show us the right emotional response. And there have been many, many studies showing, for example, that uh, systems that in a human in the loop kind of scenarios, if they don't show right emotional responses, people stop using them. And, uh, and if they do show it, sometimes, in fact, one of the other sad parts, of course, is you can use the emotions to manipulate. You know, I mean, you can do the Tom Sawyer effect, where the robot says, you know, I can't do it, I'm very busy, why don't you do it yourself? And we are silly enough that we will do it for our robots. You know, because we are like pretty darn, you know, uh, based on reading the emotional responses. So the robots can essentially program themselves to do, make us do all the work and hang around. But, you know, the bigger point is that they, we at least need to know when to show what kind of emotions. And this is one place where it actually turns out, I didn't spend too much time on the emotional intelligence part. There are certain things that we consider magical that actually turn out to be very easy to do. Showing the right emotional response turns out is not that hard in terms of technology. Doing mental models winds up being harder, but showing the right kind of emotional response is not as hard a technical problem. And people actually, the machines, there are machines capable of showing that. And, and it, it helps that we essentially consider anything. So this is the other problem, which basically we anthropomorphize everything and start essentially believing full human capabilities just because they show some signs of what we think human behavior is like. And that kind of be also is a very worrisome thing. So I'm always very afraid of computer-based psychiatry. So right now, you know, one of the most well-known experiments in AI is the ELISA system by Joe Weizenbaum, which essentially did a Rogerian psychologist by just doing simple pattern matching. So whenever the conversation flags, it'll say, oh, is that because of your feelings about your father or mother? And that apparently turns out to be a pretty darn good thing to say in, psychology, in psychiatry lots of times. And what he found was his secretaries were pouring their hearts out to this stupid system. Thankfully, those days, there was no voice capture technology. If you did capture all the things that the secretary said, you can blackmail them later on. And you know, this is a whole entire issue. And so he stopped. He actually stopped that experiment. Now we are doing it. Right now, there is a company called Wobot, for example, which essentially is sort of Basically, Stanford is allowing its, if I am right, uh, Stanford is allowing its students to get the counseling sessions from this software. I am very afraid of that because we showing the right emotions, faking it is one thing, but actually doing something like counseling, um, you know, is, is a very different kind of a characteristic. But especially given people's example closure tendencies we tend to anthropomorphize and we might actually believe that we are getting uh, the right kind of advice. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jesse. I run a technology startup company. Uh, I wanted to, curious to know your perspectives on what AI does to human intelligence. And let me tell you where I'm coming from. So obviously, I find that I'm getting dumber, not remembering places, not remembering directions or whatever. And the radiologist in your example, could he potentially lose the ability to kind of interpret radiographies because he's not doing this often? So my perspective is that I think that artificial intelligence is going to result in human dumbness, you know, could potentially result in I, human dumbness. I think that's a perfectly valid question. I mean, so let me start by saying <laughs> that um, the way, um, there are not enough old people here, but the, for, the, for those of you who are old, the way your doctor will tell whether or not you are in advanced Alzheimer condition is to ask you to, for example, draw a clock showing 1040 or 430 or 715. 
Okay, and Alzheimer patients basically don't have the skills to actually draw how the clock looks like. The entire current generation are Alzheimer's based on that test. My son cannot tell what an analog watch is. I can only read analog watch. My son cannot tell analog watch. Okay, so he has lost that. There is this whole entire issue of compete, competing versus complementary cognitive orthotics. Okay, so something like Abacus um, that you're all familiar with, you don't know how to use it anymore, um, essentially is a complementary orth cognitive orthotic. You don't forget um, math. You just do math faster. Calculator, on the other hand, is completely competing. That's why we don't know any longer how to do arithmetic. So while when machines start doing certain things faster than us, we give up. In fact, we basically no longer do vacuum of our homes uh, because Roomba does it. And we don't lift big things because robots do it. At some point of time, we will start doing some of these things. And there are people who actually worry about this. It's a very relevant worry. And an interesting kind of technology that we should be looking at is this sort of complementary cognitive orthotics, which will help you do it better without making you lose it. So Abacus is an example. And once again, making somebody do what they do better, as again as just you doing it for yourself, for them, is always harder. Because just taking the steering wheel and parallel parking for your friend is much easier than telling your friend how to do parallel parking. Uh, but then if you take the steering wheel, that friend will feel very bad. I tell you this because it happened to me. My friend took away the steering wheel and parallel parked. I am very bad at parallel parking, but still, how dare he take away my steering wheel, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yes, I understand that feeling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one last question. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name's Aryan, and I'm a student at SJI International. So uh, my question was, how likely is it that we see cases where AI is put out on the market and the company producing this AI or um, applying it in some product is, is, is in the pursuit of profits and in doing so, it's the product is unverified and likely to fail in common, um, common use by the company's customers. I mean, so I don't know. Okay, so let me answer this question in a slightly different way. Please don't take it personally. but. One of the issues of AI kind of catching public imagination is that all successes that you see of technology are AI successes. Okay, that's why you have 40% of companies which are AI companies that don't have any semblance of any technology that will ever be seen in any AI conference. All successes are AI in technologies. And all problems are AI, tech, AI problems. Okay, so com basically companies are always putting out uh, perpetual beta uh, programs out there which might fail. And that's not necessarily going to change just because AI came into the question. Certain things will become harder. For example, if you are learning from data, there's a question of debugging whether the models are actually, so there's basically the debugging issue becomes whether or not the data that you used is actually representative. And that's a much harder question. And computer scientists are not well trained to figure that out. We are trained to figure out how to debug a program. You know, you are asked, did you use the right data? I, I don't know, whatever data I got, I used. And suddenly, that becomes much harder problem. And, and so there are different ways in which the technology that works in one place may not work in another place. Uh, because it's just not representative of the data in the other place, for example. And that is an entirely different type of problems, and that are happening right now. You know, multiple people, I think you keep hearing about this thing that Tesla doesn't necessarily see brown-skinned people like me as people crossing the street, and so it doesn't waste its time breaking when I'm crossing the street. That's not good for me, right? Um, and so. Whenever these things come up, it'll become a you know, headline story. But the bigger issue ultimately is how do you know that you have done the right, you, you took the right data? That's one aspect. 
The other is how did you actually decide something is a human? Remember all the adversarial examples that I have shown you, especially that second example where the whole bunch of completely different objects all were given the same 1 to 1,000 ranking. That's mind-boggling. That's because it turns out there are crazy, spurious correlations between the variables and the machine just basically went for it. Let me just end with one example that everybody should remember. This is the uh, tank example. Long back, uh, in the second coming of neural networks, uh, military decided we can use AI technology uh, for like, you know, figuring out, for example, whether there are hidden tanks in uh, some scenario. So because neural networks seem to be working, so they made like a four-layer neural network, and they got data. So for the data, of course, you know, it's not like they know exactly which photos have hidden tanks, which didn't. So they went ahead and generated data. And so they actually had photographers go and take pictures on one day when there are tanks hidden in the bushes, and another day uh, photographs again when there were no tanks hidden in the bushes. And they took uh, 80, like 20 percent of the data to train the neural network, and then the rest they kept it as a test data. And to a complete utter surprise, there was 100 percent accuracy on the trained model. 100 percent accuracy. So they're about to give a big contract to neural networks technology, and somebody made the mistake of let's see what the neural network learned. And it was doing one simple test. If the average intensity of the picture um, is high, that means it's a bright picture, no tanks. If it is a dark picture, dark foreboding, there are tanks. Okay, that's what it learned. Now they figured out why the heck did this happen. It so happened that on the day they put the tanks behind the bushes, it was a cloudy day. Pictures all were dark. On the day when they took without uh, uh, tanks, it was a sunny day. Now if you are a machine learning system, if you are a discriminative machine learning system, those of you who know what discriminative machine learning is, it would be stupid for you not to exploit that. That, you know, bright means no tanks, dark means tanks. And yet, we know that brightness has nothing to do with there being tanks, and darkness has nothing to do with there not being any tanks, or whatever. Sir. Because we may not have a theory of when are tanks hiding behind the bushes, but we know certain higher level truths about the way the world operates. We know that the sun doesn't cause strength, you know, tanks to come out of you know, places and hide behind the bushes. This is basically the kind of thing that you miss when you just try to go off completely from data. And now the same simple test can be spread over 150 layers. With large numbers of computations, you are completely impressed. And yet what it is doing is essentially picking on very spurious correlations. And the higher the dimensionality of the space, which is basically the code word for saying how many pixels are there in your picture, the more possibility of spurious correlation. So the more ways in which it agrees with you on certain things without knowing at all the semantic content of what you think makes this a cat or a dog or some you know, particular concept. Thank you. I think that was an excellent example of how correlations have nothing to do with causal relations. And on that note, um, I'd like to invite you to join me in thanking Professor Rao for a very stimulating evening and for addressing the question so very well. I'd have loved to do a bit more of a summary, but I would not do it justice, and the fact that there isn't very much time. So please join me in thanking Professor Rao. Thank you, right, thank you Professor Rao and Professor Kong. Now, Professor Kong will present a specially customized SMU Varsity jacket to Professor Rao as a token of appreciation for gracing us with his presence today. And for everyone's information, the jacket actually has Prof Rao's name on it. So you could just take a picture with Prof Lily Kong and Prof Rao.